Chimere is a distant planet. It is defined by waves of life brought from Earth and set free to evolve independently in this new context. The indigenous life of the planet, swarms of microbes called magic by the people who live there, are what harvest Earth organisms and make copies on Chimere. As the asteroid which concluded the Mesozoic never struck Chimere, dinosaurs remain the dominant terrestrial megafauna. While Megaraptorans represent the only large theropods in the known world, the enormous eastern continent of Kyrule shows a greater diversity of these giant predators. Megaraptorans remain the dominant predators of the continent, notably outnumbering the competition by a substantial margin, but two other theropod clades have their giants relegated to specialized niches, which we will meet in this series. Next week we will introduce the giant Abelosaurids. Today is the introduction of the giant dromaeosaur, Komu Kabawe, the Titan Slayer. During the Tyrant Dynasty, Tyrannosauroids were the top predator. In their shadows, alongside young tyrants, several predators served as their ecological vassals. Entelodonts came during the Oligocene and, while omnivorous, still shared the niche with a variety of ceratosaurs, such as noosaurids and abelosaurids, and half-ton eudromaeosaurs, similar in build to Eutoraptor. While the tyrants of Kyrule died, these three clades stepped up to the ecological plate, each claiming a mantle. Entelodonts took the prairie and became the giant Pokodu. Abelosaurids took the wetlands, and forests were dominion of the cockatrice. These cockatrices quickly became massive. As they were already at the upper limits of what anatopical features set cockatrices apart, such as compromising tail strength for agility and the use of their formidable toe claw, their bodies rapidly took on the form of a much more conventional large theropod. Their second toe was still large and curved, yet now only served to hold down prey while they killed with massive jaws. To accommodate the fact that they were now too heavy to balance at the knee, yet had already atrophied much of the cotofemoralis muscles, which give large theropods their powerful stride and tips the balance back, their tail became extremely long, and they built up substantial fat reserves at the base of the tail, which shifted their balance back toward the hips. Their bodies are still a bit tilted up, a relic of their ancestral configuration, but as happens all the time in nature, they may do despite a suboptimal form. As their primary weapon was now useless, these giant cockatrices invested heavily in what, to most of their kind, is a tool only to restrain and process food, their jaws. Cockatrices already have flat and serrated teeth for cutting flesh and bone, and this was doubled down upon. The teeth of this lineage became trapezoidal for three cutting edges. Like the now extinct Carcharodontosaurs, their backs developed tall neural spines to secure enormous muscles. They don't have particularly powerful jaws, but retaining their hip flexibility and having enormous back muscles means that they can slice through hide, muscle, and even bone with a few tugging bites. This weapon is poorly suited for grasping smaller prey, and even prey their own size are sometimes pulled along rather than cut through reducing the efficacy of these weapons. This is, however, an excellent weapon to be used against the most abundant, large herbivores of Kyrule, and something so large that their mass makes shearing bites extremely effective, the Titanosaurs. Although all the Titanosaurs in the known world belong to the same family of heavily armored gardeners and wanderers, in Kyrule, Titans are much more diverse. The truly colossal monsters of the Tyrant Dynasty are gone, though several lineages of smaller titans quickly grew large as the planet recovered. Though these armored gardeners managed to reach the known world and thrive, thanks in no small part to the mineral reserves in their osteoderms, in the forests of Kyrule, this very expensive adaptation is actually disadvantageous. They might be able to endure for a longer period of time, continuing to grow where it counts during the dry months of open territory between the lush Edens of Kyrule and the Known World, but back in Kyrule, 
The most successful Titan clade invests all of their nutrients and energy into getting big fast. While the armored tillers often take around 20 years to reach sexual maturity and 30 years before their growth plateaus, the most abundant clade of Chirulian Titans reaches maturity at 10 years of age and their growth plateaus between 15 and 20. Taking half as long to begin nesting and reaching a size where they are immune to predation is obviously an enormous advantage that could only be done in these verdant habitats. While there are other sauropods and big herbivores in these lush forests, notably pachycephalosaurs and phascelosaurs on the large end and several mammals and dinosaurs weighing around a ton in the medium size, Hoplotitan is the most abundant and diverse titanosaur genus in Kairul. Their name is in reference to the formations of ancient Greek infantrymen, which, assembly scholars note, the lines of titanosaurs form when threatened bears notable resemblance. When titans line up, all predators and competing herbivores in the area flee the scene. However, even a lone adult titan has little to fear from megaraptor ants that rule the forest. These predators are well adapted to kill prey just above their own size and smaller, with formidable talons built to pierce vitals after wrestling them into submission. These tactics do not work against prey several orders of magnitude larger than the theropod, and what is otherwise top predators avoid titans. However, there is a predator specialized in routing these formations, vanquishing the titans, and processing their meat the agile and saw-jawed Titanophonius. The Chirolans that the assembly spoke with called it Kumu Kabawe, roughly translating to the same thing, Titan Slayer. When put into the context of their prey, their anatomy makes much more sense than if they were assumed to take on the generalist macro-predatory role of a Megaraptoran. Rather than try to restrain great beasts or break their bones, they simply cut through them. Their hip configuration, trading power and endurance for agility and shock absorption, allows them to jog in, deliver a formidable bite, and fall back with it, while evading retaliation. They aren't as fast as a Megaraptoran, but they don't need to be. They just have to catch up to a Titanosaur. Titans can be surprisingly swift considering their massive bodies are riddled with air sacs, and even large sub-adults can move at a respectable 15 miles per hour, but Titanophonius is able to keep up, and their attacks can be quite devastating. Unlike most cockatrices, which are of the same size in both sexes or have slightly larger females, it is the males of Titanophonius which are larger and more robust. Females are often 12 to 13 meters long and weigh between 4 and 5 tons, while males reach 14 meters and 5 to 6 tons. Females will often share territory with a few of their sisters or female cousins. It's not uncommon for these sister groups to live near related females, though often they have to establish themselves quite far from home. Dominant males which are from quite far away as their own fathers ran them off at adolescence, are usually solitary, though sometimes two brothers will share a territory. A dominant male will have a territory which overlaps with several female groups. His greater size, and therefore stride, helps cover more ground. He often joins in hunts with various sister groups rather than hunt on his own. Males are not as agile as females, but their greater size means that they are often instrumental in weighing down a titan so that the sisters can cut into the muscles of the leg or open the throat. Most of these hunts are just the sisters and maybe their mate, but when an opportunity like an injured or sick adult titan is spotted, the slayers will gather in greater number, sometimes working together in teams of up to a dozen individuals to take down a giant in a hunt that can take days and will feed them for weeks. Like Chirul and Megaraptorans, Titanophons are quite good parents. Mothers and their sisters will closely care for the hatchlings for up to nine months, but stop regularly feeding them once they lay the next year's eggs. 
By nine months, the young are several hundred pounds. They subsist primarily on small game in their mother's territory, often the lizard and mammalian potential nest raiders. In so doing, they help protect their little siblings and get paid in small game, and living in with two to five enormous theropods means that threats to these young avoid the territory. Unlike Megaraptorans, which can take up to 15 years to reach maturity, Titanophonius reach maturity at around the age of five. They are typically chased out of their natal territory at three, however, which is when they pass half a ton in weight and experience a tremendous growth spurt. Before this growth spurt, their overall build is much more similar to the conventional dromaeosaur. Their sickle claw is elevated and lethal, they make full and proper use of their knee-centered balance and being extremely agile, and their teeth have the standard knife-shaped morphology, well-suited for grasping, struggling prey typical of the clade. During this juvenile stage, they hunt a wide range of prey. After being chased off, they develop macro-predatory specializations. Their toe shifts forward to bear weight, their bulk shifts back toward the center of the balance at the hips, and their teeth not only reduce in number, they lose grasping capacity in favor of broad slicing surfaces. Once they no longer have the protection of their aunt and mother, they have to grow fast. Megaraptorans that catch them go for the kill. They are vulnerable to their prey at this stage, and their new suite of anatomical adaptations are poorly suited to catch prey that they have prior experience with. While Megaraptorans have a long childhood observing their parents and steadily working their way up to large game, Titan Slayers are thrown into the proverbial ring with little experience and have to figure it all out fast. While packs chased from their mother and aunt's territory, in numbers between 10 and 30 females, it is not uncommon for there to only be 3 to 5 by the time they reach physical maturity and actually establish a territory. Males have an even tougher gauntlet. Their drive to be dominant over competition means that they regularly feed and fight and bicker with each other. When their juvenile packs also number between 10 and 20 when chased off by their parents, these fights often turn lethal very quickly. Subordinate males must flee this for their own safety, and the bicker of dominant males gets so violent that a lone survivor or pair is usually established within a few months. This experience not only helps them establish a territory once they reach adulthood, it also prepares them to fight off Megaraptorans. Robust monarchs of the Kyrulean forest often outweigh the largest titan slayer by several tons, but these kings prefer to settle their own scores by intimidation so an experienced Titanophon can be surprisingly efficient in defending his territory. As a Megaraptoran inflates their chest and spreads their arms to brandish claws nearly a meter long, a giant Carcturus simply charges and goes for the throat. As a single bite or tug can rend open jugular and windpipe, Megaraptorans are well documented to stand down with a charge. They do sometimes hunt and kill titanophons, and they certainly are the dominant predator in terms of number, but this aggression from male titan slayers has helped keep the species from being eliminated. It also helps that they don't target the same prey, so the two species can coexist with albeit tense conditions in a way that other large predators have failed to do in the advance of Megaraptorans. Titan forests tend to have more titans than a lot of Megaraptoran's preferred prey, which further favors the survival of titan slayers. The clade have lost several genera as their range is smaller than it was before the arrival of the robust monarchs six million years ago, but Titanophonius proves the legacy persists in specialists, and through such ecological focus, stability can be found. Another clade has survived thanks to similar specializations, in their case by taking on the wetlands and prairies, the Ceratosaurs. Next week, we will meet the Tikakatik, a wetland specialist that rules their dominion without question or challenge until the arrival of the Kudujaku. 
Cheers to Thomas for sponsoring this episode. It was a lot of fun building its ecology and life cycle. Excited for next week as well. Shout out to my Patreon patrons, and thank you for watching. Stay fantastic, everyone. Cheers, folks! Thank <laughs> you.